for anybody that is wondering and wants to go just deeper down the rabbit hole with Alex, we had an incredible conversation when he came on the podcast uh, about a month, two months ago. Time is going a little slow for me these days, so it's probably wrong. Might need to uh, fact check that one, but a few months ago. And we just talked all things like changes, ML ops slash foundational models. And I know you got more for us right now. So I am going to hand it over to you and give you the stage. That's awesome. I'm super excited. Yeah, it was a really fun chat. It feels like, uh, I, I think everything feels, the, the, the effective time scales are very interesting in AI world these days because everything <laughs> changes so fast. And I guess one, uh, one segue into what I'll chat about today is, you know, some things change very rapidly, other things don't. Um, so um, can you see my screen now? Oh, yeah. I'll just check it Okay, great. So um, I, uh, I don't know how we're doing chat um, or, or Q&A or anything like that here. Uh, I, can't see, I can't see anyone. I'm just seeing full screen my presentation. So Demetrius, if you want to jump in or if, if, if you're doing live Q&A, feel free to make this interactive. Um, totally, totally. I will. Works best. Exactly. I, I'll, um, I'll jump in if something comes up and there's a great uh, question in the chat. Otherwise, I'll, I'll leave it to you and we can keep all the questions for like the last five minutes. Awesome. Sounds great. So, um, and just to do a time check, I think uh, I've got until 12.10, right? Yeah, I mean, we started like five minutes late, so 12.15. Awesome. Oh, generosity today. This is great. Um, <laughs> Cool. So I'll, I'll jump in. And um, as a quick intro, I'm Alex. I'm one of the co-founders and CEO at Snorkel AI. I'm also uh, an affiliate assistant professor at University of Washington, uh, where uh, at, at both places. And and then, uh, you know, back when I was working on the Snorkel project at Stanford with the team, uh, everything really is around this idea of, of data-centric AI, this idea um, that a lot of the development that is most critical and highest leverage for building for building AI is around manipulating, curating, labeling, slicing, sampling data, um, more broadly developing data, uh, even more so than you know, picking the right architecture or the right, or, you know, tuning the knobs in the right way. Um, and I'll talk at a high level in part of this about how that's been accelerated by this, this, uh, this rise of foundation models. And I'll share some other broader thoughts as well. If we get into the weeds, uh, I'll, I can also share my thoughts on uh, some of the work actually out of uh, my, my co-founder Chris's lab at Stanford on, uh, and, and the Snorkel research team on uh, ways of automating uh, prompt engineering in, in part via, via weak supervision. So that'll be a, uh, you know, an in the weeds teaser if we get to that and anyone wants to remind me or I remember, we can talk a little bit about that. But otherwise, I'm going to go through kind of a high level uh, tour today. And thank you all for taking the time to, to, to be here and watch the talk. Hopefully ask some uh, interesting and hard questions either during or at the end so that, you know, to make it interesting. Okay, so quick outline. I'll start with, and Demetrius, I have to apologize here because I'm opening with some, some shots fired. I'm going to switch right away to, to saying uh, foundation model, not LLM, which I get Ooh. is a, a kind of aggressive move given the name of the, of the conference, <laughs> but it's, it's kind of critical to how Ooh. we do things. I like yeah. it. I got to make things a little interesting, right? So I'll start with that and, um, uh, you know, Obviously, uh, I'll actually flip back and forth probably between FMs and LLMs um, uh, throughout without realizing. But I, I do want to, you know, start on that note and and just uh, introduce why you'll hear me in you know some instances saying foundation model. I'll share a little bit of this this high level idea that a lot of the future is going to be around, um, you know, let's call it GPTU rather than GPTX. I'll then dive into um, how you make these more customized and domain specific and performance foundation models. What, what is the development, the data center development you do? I'll use some of our work at Snorkel as a case study, although again, I'm not gonna uh, be overly focused on that. It'll just be an illustration of you know, the system building we're doing around these ideas. And then if I get time, I can talk about some other you know, interesting challenges that are really orthogonal to our work at Snorkel in the uh, foundation model space, just picked up from some of the customers we work with and, and, and some, you know, some general thoughts, may or may not get to that. Um, but that's the high level outline and I'll jump in now. So it's not that, uh, that, that it's a, maybe this is a little underwhelming as a shots fired slide because it doesn't, it, it, well, I don't know, Demetrius, you tell me, but I don't, I don't think this is the most aggressive looking slide uh, with my, you know, 
uh, hastily Googled image of, of uh, house <laughs> and foundations. Um, I but it. I do want to kind of introduce why do we say foundation model? Uh, why, um, you know, my, my co-founder, Chris, uh, and, and a bunch of our uh, Stanford colleagues have anchored on this term with, with uh, the center there. Um, there's really three reasons. Um, the first one is that a really exciting one, which is we've we've moved beyond language. Actually, any data type, uh, any data, you know, any data type that that has some underlying graph structure, admits the exact same types of you know self supervision or auto regressive methods uh, beyond just you know a sequence of tokens. Right, we're seeing that uh, with image and multimodal data. Uh, we're going to see it with with everything from databases to to genomics, or we're already seeing that. So really, this is you know a boom that we're going to continue seeing far beyond beyond uh, you know the classic language models. That's reason number one. The second reason is um, you know uh, often I hear uh, you know gen or generative AI uh, as a as synonym for large language models, but really all AI application types, not just generative but also discriminative or predictive, which is where a lot of the you know the classical and high value workloads uh, still live. Our view is that all of these are built on top of foundation models. Um, so if we get time, we can talk more about that, but that's kind of point number two. And the third point where most of my talk will kind of dive into is this, you know, the idea behind the name, the, the basic and simple, but, but very critical metaphor, which is that foundation models are, are foundations and you still need to, you know, build the specific house or building for your specific setting and needs on top. And uh, we'll talk about how you do that coming up. Also, there's a leaf blower, which happens more times during talks than I think would be, uh, you know, uh, occurring by random chance. If you have any problems with my audio, let me know. Otherwise, we should be fine. You're sounding okay. all right. I didn't even notice it until you said it. Awesome. Okay, I did, but uh, it sounds like we're good. So, diving in, I'm going to start now by just kind of opening the aperture and, and uh, I guess, firing some more shots. Although, again, this is mostly about, you know, open source community love and predictions of where, um, you know, practical realities are gonna, uh, you know, of, of, you know, AI use cases and, and the market are gonna take us. But, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll say this a little bit more declaratively just to make this talk interesting. So I'll start by saying that, um, you know, the entire field owes, you know, the GPT line of work, uh, you know, a massive debt and, and I'm a, a, a huge fan. And uh, I hope that, you know, GPTX continues to, to increment up because, uh, you know, it, it's been driving the field forward and it's a you know, truly incredible innovation. But I do think that most uh, usage in the enterprise, even in, you know, in individual and consumer settings, is going to be a lot more around, let's call it GPTU rather than GPTX. So why is that? Three high level points I'll start with here just to get us all thinking. Number one. We've seen a lot of evidence recently. You know, this is both first principles, but also just you know, uh, demonstrations that have been uh, you know accelerating of late around the lack of defensibility of, of closed API models, and you know, very correlated with that, this kind of just boom of, of open source foundation model innovation and proliferation. Number two, the more durable moat. Again, no real surprises here if you think about it uh, from first principles is around private data and, and domain specific knowledge, whether that's in a person, in an enterprise, in an organization, we're seeing that and, and some examples of the power of actually leveraging that, which I think is going to spread. And a third point, which will be the segue into the rest of the talk and a lot of what we do at Snorkel is um, this idea that really the last mile, all of the hard work to get these, you know, to go from foundation to house for specific use cases in specific settings is really where um, you know a lot of the the effort goes, vast majority of the effort goes, and, and a vast majority of the, the value um, and and you know differentiation is going to be captured, and I'll talk about how that's done and what's exciting there. So just to go through those first couple of points high level, you know there's been a a, a proliferation of, of awesome of awesome logos and and uh, I guess the sunglasses thing has been taking off with these recent projects. So for folks who who um, haven't been, you know, living and breathing foundation model Twitter every, you know, five minutes, uh, like a, like a sane, healthy person. Um, uh, one uh, recent, a uh, very interesting project that came out actually right around when GPT-4 dropped, so it, 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 you know, didn't get noticed by everyone, 
was this uh, alpaca project out of Stanford. Basically, at a high level, what they did is they spent, a, I think, a couple hundred bucks on uh, uh, Ch chat GPT API calls. And they were able to use that along with a, a self-instruct method out of some, some uh, out of a team at UW to basically train uh, a 7 billion parameter model, the, the, the open source or the, the Facebook Llama model to, and the evaluation is not fully finished, but to, to have very uh, uh, similar levels of, of skills and, 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 and outputs as ChatGPT. So basically just by a very cheap set of queries, they were able to basically clone um, or, or, or come close in many ways to cloning ChatGPT. And then we've seen a bunch of other follow-on work. Databricks cloned the cloning method with their Dolly model. Um, uh, and, and now there's Dolly v2, uh, where they put some of their own crowdsource data into. There's a, an interesting Koala project out of Berkeley where they show that they could get you know, the same or even better performance as Alpaca with just very careful curation of the data sets. The high level point here is that um, you know, it doesn't really seem like uh, closed API models are going to be that highly defensible if they have any kind of you know, sufficiently cheap API. And if the open source continues to advance in terms of supporting these models, which we see no signs of slowing down, and it's quite, quite exciting. So where do we actually have more durability? Well, one first principles concept is that it's gonna really arise out of private data distributions and, you know, and, and knowledge. And we saw one exciting example that's come out recently with uh, Bloomberg GPT. So they took a bunch of private financial data and they were able to train their own model that was able to perform better on that specific domain. So, you know, A, I think there's going to be a, a flattening of the space in terms of just general purpose web data and general conversational and other kind of generic task style foundation models. Number two, we're gonna see this kind of family tree start to really bloom of domain specific models, many of which are gonna be leveraging you know, private data and specialized knowledge to be you know, better foundations for those specific areas. Um, that gets into the kind of GPTU idea. Um, and then the third thing, which I'll talk more about is again, the building of the house on top. And so I, I in no way I mean to pick on the Bloomberg paper, but it's interesting that very few people these days actually uh, well, this would come off a little cynical, but very, very few people, uh, you know, actually open the papers often on these these uh, these projects. And so, if you actually look even the blog post that the Bloomberg GPT team released, you'll note what you see in many of these these uh, evaluations that are done, you know, thoroughly on on proper held out data sets, which is that it does better in a relative sense, which is a very exciting achievement and proof of of this power of domain specific data. But if you look here at the financial and, 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 and you know, the financial specific tasks, it's in the 60s, right? For most applications, that's nowhere near a, a you know, production deployable accuracy level. So again, that gets to this, love, this idea that even with all this development, both closed and open source, even with this specialization and leveraging of, of you know, domain specific data and expertise, you're still building the foundations and you still have a lot of work to go. What's what always in AI, over decades has always been the hardest part, the last mile, as any kind of you know, uh, uh, data scientist or, or ML expert who's shipped real stuff to production knows that you have to do on top. So that's what I'll, I'll, uh, I'll talk about there. I'll pause for a second, just any, any, any uh, questions, comments, push back on this, this high level framing before I get into this, this uh, you know, last mile building the house part. We're good so far. Awesome, okay. so. Let's get into this. And what I'm going to share with you is, is you know, our perspective that a lot of the, you know, the building the house really revolves around uh, these high-level ideas of of data versus model-centric AI. Uh, and and I'll, I'll share that both in terms of high-level ideas, and there's a ton of innovation in the space and the community, uh, and and that'll be kind of with my you know academic community hat on. And then I'll also give an example of how we're supporting it. Uh, in, in production settings with our platform at the at Snorkel, the company, uh, which we call Snorkel Flow. So, um, and, and here, you know, partly because I'm, <laughs> partly because I'm stealing slides, uh, uh, and partly because it's just a, you know, it's a relevant stand. And I'll talk about enterprises. This could be 
you know, a commercial enterprise, this could be a government agency, this could be a, a, an open source organization, anything where there's a, you know, a collection of non-public, non-generic data and real production use cases. So that's, that's, you know, for the purposes of this talk, think of enterprise as a stand-in for any kind of organization or setting like that. So one way that I think it's helpful to think about this is at least collapsing it to two dimensions is think of one dimension where you, you, you're basically asking how bespoke are you, or, or unique is this data? This is, you know, for ML folks in the audience, this is just old transfer learning intuition, right? Um, if you train a giant model, a small model, a giant model on web data, it's going to work better on data closer to what it trained on. Um, pardon me, versus, you know, very bespoke different data inside a bank or a hospital or a government, government agency, for example. Uh, and then think about the x-axis is what is the accuracy requirement or accuracy proxy metric, whatever you choose, before you can actually use this thing. We see a lot of, of, of very exciting use cases for, you know, especially generative type use cases where no one even measures the accuracy or even really knows how to, right? If I'm trying to generate some marketing copy or some cool images um, for a kind of co-pilot style application, I don't even know necessarily how to measure what accuracy means. And I don't need it to be that good because it's just a, a starting point. It's a, it's, a, it's a part of a human loop process. So there's high tolerance for failure um, versus a lot of the AI applications that are actually shipped in production have to be, you know, 90, 95, 99% accurate, accurate before they can even be, be shipped to production. So a lot of the really exciting momentum and demos that we're seeing are kind of in this lower left quadrant where you're testing on data very similar to what, you know, GPTX or other foundation models were trained on. You know, you either have kind of low accuracy requirements because there's high degree of failure tolerance, say in a human loop system, or you don't even have an established way of measuring what, you know, some accuracy style metric. And a lot of where, you know, the house building is both hardest and more, most valuable is in this upper right quadrant where you have, you know, non-standard data um, you know, in a bank, a government agency, a hospital system, mo most, most places in the world, most enterprises for sure. And where you actually have high levels of accuracy you need to get to before you can actually ship something. Um, so I'll give an example of this uh, with some of, of our internal data. Um, and this is using a variety of foundation models, uh, some you know, uh, early results with GPT-4, also smaller models like BERT and CLIP. Um, and here we're just, you know, there's, there's more data here and, and, and we'll be releasing uh, some of the latest GPT-4 data from uh, our experiences soon. But just at a very high level, you know, comparing the out of the box performance, so a zero shot and, and, and the few shot performances are pretty similar of just using GPT-4, one of these models out of the box. And this is looking at a range of problems from info extraction for a large pharma company to um, actually an open source case study we released on classifying legal clauses uh, um, to, to image and chat things as well. And if you actually look um, at the gap, you have to fine tune uh, on, on tens or even hundreds of thousands of, of labeled data points to actually even start to approach uh, production level accuracy. And I'll note here just to be very precise that GPT-4 doesn't have a fine tuning interface. So actually, if you look at these case studies with GPT-4, this is fine tuning a, uh, actually GPT-3. So it's actually fine tuning a, a, a less powerful model, uh, but gets a significant leap in quality. Um, and, and if you're curious on more data, you can look at actually this legal data case study. We're, we're updating it pretty soon. Uh, this includes in between the 59 and the 83, all kinds of few shot techniques, advanced prompting techniques, nothing really approaches, uh, you know, the, the you know, good old fashioned fine tuning on labeled data. But this is mainly just to show before we get into methods that you have to do a lot of work still to build the house on top of the foundations. And there's lots of work out in the public domain. I'm, I'm you know, highlighting one of my favorites here uh, because I was, uh, uh, I was lazy and I just grabbed one. There's a lot of work and, and you know, there will be a, a wave coming out once uh, folks have enough time to evaluate uh, GPT-4 and other models. This was an evaluation of ChatGPT where the conclusion was that um, ChatGPT was, again, an, an incredibly impressive generalist. Hence the bet that this is, you know, Jack, you know models like this are gonna be the foundations for, for all AI development. That's certainly the bet that we're taking. Um, but 
it was on average 25% worse than a specialized model that was specially trained for the given task. And it was, it was over 25 NLP tasks. And by the way, that specialist model was often a, a minuscule fraction of the size and therefore cost of ChatGPT. So we're seeing these kind of same results out in the open source, um, just a little behind because these things take time to, these large benchmarks take time to run. Um, so how, how do we build that house? How do we get from the kind of baseline out of the box performance that, again, for real AI use cases, or at least for many real AI use cases in that upper right quadrant we showed are just not anywhere near good enough to ship to production. How do we go from that, you know, generalist jack of all trades foundation to a, you know, a specialist or an expert that's deployable in production? Uh, well, uh, surprise, surprise, uh, already announced that this was gonna be the, uh, the, the technical perspective, but um, at a very high level, what we've been working on out of Stanford, UW, and, and Snorkel the company over the last eight years or so is exploring this idea of, of what we call data-centric development. This idea that, you know, rather than pursuing things that the, the often the kind of classical way, how, how ML and AI is still often taught in intro or most intro classes, where the data comes from somewhere else, it's janitorial work, it's exogenous to your process as a data scientist, it's not your your, your job, I often think of this as the Kaggle era of machine learning, where you just, you know, your machine learning journey starts when you download your data set from Kaggle, all nicely labeled and curated and collected, and then you start, you know, tweaking your model architectures. Data-centric development is the idea in its extreme of kind of flipping that on its head, where the model is now fairly standardized and fixed and may not even change or maybe automatically configured in your process. And most of your data science process, your workflow, your journey is really about iterating on the data, labeling it, sampling it, curating it, augmenting it, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's not always that extreme, but one thing that I'll point out is the, the wave of foundation models has really made it much more extreme than it ever has been. Think about it from the perspective of a user. You know, if you find out that your foundation model-based application is messing up on some patient population or some subset of sat the satellite images you're analyzing or some you know, subset of, of, of legal documents, more than ever before, you can't go and just tweak the model architecture. You can't go and you know, tune you know, by hand some of the trillion parameters. You effectively have to go to the data, whether that's labeling, prompting, et cetera. It's, it's all these, these kind of data-centric interfaces. So in our view, the rise of foundation models has also accelerated and in some ways completed this shift from model-centric to data-centric development. So that's a high-level thought I'll leave you with. Uh, again, you know, one, of, one, one uh, uh, you know, of our favorite examples here is the, the uh, GPTX family. And I'll note that, that you know, the advancement that got at least a large chunk of the world you know, uh, uh, going crazy over these, these advances was really a delta between GPT-3 and 3.5 that was all about human supervision, right? A lot of folks are familiar with the, the RLHF term, but you know, I think it's helpful. And if you look at recent work, it's you know, more precisely, you can separate the, the inputs from humans and the mechanism by which the model was updated, which is the RL, RL part. Um, and the, the, the input was just labels. In this case, it was, uh, it was uh, you know, labels in the form of, of rankings and, or orderings. And then there was further labeling in terms of the thumbs up, thumbs down. And now there's even further labeling and, and uh, response generation being paid for yet again. So the Delta was not really about the model architecture. The, del the Delta was all about the, the, the data and the supervision. So this is you know, one, one really great example of this, this, uh, this data centric development idea. So you know, our idea is that, um, and, and the central concept of both snorkel, the academic work, and this data-centric, uh, you know, um, uh, concept is that, you know, the the critical layer between kind of these base foundation models, and here I'll depart or I'll be orthogonal to that point that I raised. This doesn't matter whether you're starting with um, closed APIs like OpenAI, always a fun fun sentence to say, or open source models like I pitched. I think are going to become even more uh, more more prevalent. Um, whatever you start with, you have this layer of your stack where you have to do development to fine tune or adapt them for your applications. 
and that development is done via data primarily. Um, and this is where a lot of the challenge comes in because, you know, manual annotation is extremely difficult. A lot of it's difficult because um, it's just costly and slow. And especially for most, uh, um, you know, non-trivial complex settings and certainly most enterprises, they can't just outsource it. So this takes, you know, huge amounts of in-house efforts, often from, you know, very highly paid and, and, and very busy subject matter experts, you know, a clinician, a lawyer, a network technician, and, you know, an underwriter, et cetera. Um, and it's also very brittle because every time something changes, you, you, you don't really have any way of modifying manual labeling. So here's where I'll, I'll segue in uh, to Circle Flow, which is our system for, um, you know, for developing foundation models using data-centric AI. And again, I'll just quickly pause on some of this high-level stuff that I covered before. Any any questions? Any comments? Otherwise, we can leave it to there. That. Yeah, there is a, a few questions that came through. One is like, when does GPTU need more than thirty-two thousand tokens of context? Oh, okay, yeah, great question. So, I mean, I, I think that I think that's mostly orthogonal. Is like, I think that the extension of the context window length. Um, a lot of that work actually has been 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 pushed by some great work by uh, um, Tree Dow and others in um, my co-founder Chris's lab. Just advertising. If anyone is hiring for academic positions, I believe Tree's on the market. He's amazing. His work on flash attention has been been behind a lot of this these advances in context window length. Um, but I, I, I see a lot of that as as somewhat orthogonal. I, I think it's it's extremely exciting. Um, there's a ton of, of possibilities that get opened up when you when you open up the context window. Um, you know, you can. I think there's there's ways to basically unify fine tuning and prompting by putting all the label data into the context window. You can handle obviously larger contexts and, and, and more complex documents and et cetera. Um, but you know, you can still get by with a shorter context window. It just puts greater emphasis on fine tuning, uh, on 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 you know various kind of chunking. And compression schemes, et cetera. So I see those kind of orthogonal to to um, to a lot of the stuff I'm talking about today. Although very exciting. There is another. There's another one that came through also that I wanted to say, and it's uh, from Pradeep asking: We can use the expensive large language models with last mile prompt engineering until we get enough training data to train or fine tune GPTU. And Maybe that wasn't so much of a question. <laughs> now that I read it again, I, at first I thought it was a question. And now I'm thinking that that was probably just a statement. But maybe you have something you want to talk about on that statement. <laughs> well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, mostly, I mostly agree. I mean, it, it really just depends on your, your use cases, right? I think one of the, you know, the key things in characterizing a use case is, um, uh you know the various different ways you could talk about this, but call it the the failure tolerance of the of the use case, right? H how accurate do you, do you need to be to go to production? And um, yeah, you know, some of these things are scalar, meaning you 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 get you get better results, you get better ROI if you improve the accuracy. In which case, yeah, like starting with you know a, a, a zero shot or prompting based technique that gets you to that kind of sixty percent level, and then gradually kind of tuning and developing it with data-centric AI to go higher is a very viable strategy. In other settings, 60% or as I mentioned before, like not even knowing how to measure the accuracy for some of these generative use cases is good enough because it's just a co-pilot use case where it's just meant to assist a creative process. And there's always going to be a human editing uh, and, and you know, the final result. And then in other settings, and as you could guess, this is a lot of where, where we operate, um, you know, getting in the 60s is just, isn't good enough for anything. You can't ship that model. And so you really are blocked until you can get that, that data development done uh, to, to, to get it to a, a production level accuracy. Um, so I guess I'd say I agree with the statement in certain use case settings. In others, you're blocked until you can do that, that you know, fine tuning or downstream development. And, and in others, you're fine because it either works really well out of the box because it's a very generic or kind of standard data task or you don't care about the accuracy as much because of the, the use case setting. Um, right, that goes back to the kind of quad chart I shared, or at least that's one way of thinking about it. Right awesome. On. So I'll, I'll push on because I'm, I'm almost at time. So I'll just give a little preview. I definitely won't get to the last section, but um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just give a little view of the very high level loop uh, that, that we support uh, in Snorkel Flow. 
Um, and I'll note that you know a lot of what we've you know over the last you know many years we've we've kind of anchored the description of snorkel flow on uh, is you know developing training data for training models from scratch. Actually, a lot of our workloads have actually been using it to fine tune what's called a medium foundation models like BERT uh, for many years now. Um, uh, and, and now, you know, obviously a lot of the world is moving towards, you know, and, and we're, we're, you know, we've been heavily invested for the last year or two in moving to, you know, building on top of foundation models. So the basic workflow in, in snorkel flow today is starting with some kind of base foundation model. It could be closed source. It could be open source. Again, I, 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 I threw out some bets at the start of the presentation, but we're we're completely orthogonal to that. You you, you bring whatever you want to uh, to start, and basically the process starts by defining the specific task you want to accomplish. Let's say, you know, I, I, you know, a lot of our our customers are you know still focused on predictive tasks where a lot of the value lies. I want to, you know, classify these contracts with very high accuracy. So you take your your base foundation model it was say trained on web data and you apply it or snorkel flow automatically applies it to your data and your task so that you can kind of you know see how it does to start and that's when the guided error analysis starts so the idea is let's apply your foundation model to the data and if you think about it how else could you actually inspect how your foundation models do it right you can't go and poke around the model weights at least practically today you have to apply it to data to be able to even see how it's doing. So that's that first step. And then, you know, you start this data centric loop, which begins with, um, you know, discovering error modes in your base foundation model via guided error analysis. I'll skip over details there, but that's a lot of the, the, the work we've done both academic and commercial side. And then your goal is to correct them and to do that as, as rapidly as possible. And this is where if you've, um, you know, heard me give a talk before or seen any of the other snorkel materials, I'll refer you to that. If, if not, a lot of the the um, uh, the acceleration that we get and a lot of what our academic work has been around is these radically more efficient and, and programmatic ways of doing this correction, this corrective labeling. And as I teased at the beginning, I'm basically at time, so I, I won't go in depth, but I'll just note that um, this idea of programmatic labeling or in the academic side, we've often called it weak supervision, is a, a powerful way to unify all different types of input. So it could be a heuristic, it could be a knowledge base, it could be using you know, clusters and embedding space, it could be manual labels, it also could be a prompt. So there's a, some, some nice work out of the, the Stanford lab on, um, and, and also the Snorkel research team on how prompts can actually be viewed as programmatic sources of supervision or labeling and automatically combined and modeled. So you don't need to find kind of one perfect prompt. You just dump them all in along with any other sources of information and it gets all combined by snorkel flow. Um, and I won't have time to go into the how, but lots out there in the academic space. And then the last step and I'll end here is basically one of two paths. You can, or three I have here on the slide. You can always you know, take the data that you labeled and, and just export it. But the two main paths, and I think this is again, broader than just snorkel flow is Either you go back and you update your foundation model with this, you know, uh, corrected and augmented uh, uh, labeled data. And again, the standard way for production accuracies that you'd still do is, is fine tuning. Or, and we see this increasingly in our customers, um, you actually now distill this into a, a smaller model that is specialized for this task. And I'll just quickly note there's a case study that we have up on this, this open source Ledger data set. It's a contract classification, 100 way classification problem. And the net result, uh, you start with actually an ensemble of foundation models we did in this, in this case. Uh, you do this to development and you actually get not only a 41 uh, accuracy point boost above the kind of, this was with GPT-3, the GPT-3 baseline, but we actually now distilled it into a smaller foundation model that was 1400 times as small. Um, so this is a lot of where we think things are heading, you know, starting with the foundation models as your foundations, but then building the house on top via data center development. And here's where I lose the, the, the house building metaphor, but basically also then distilling it into smaller models for, for production accuracy. So let me cut there. I know I'm at time. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's time for questions, but at least we covered already a couple. And uh, thank you all for the time today. 
Dude, amazing. For the questions, one thing that I would say is for everybody that's looking to continue chatting with Alex, jump into Slack. Alex, I think you're in Slack. If you're not, I'm going to send you the invite right now and go to the channel, the community conference channel, tag Alex in there and ask him about all of this stuff. I want to give a huge thank you to Snorkel while you're on the stream with me because you all have sponsored this event and I am so grateful for that. I also want to mention to anyone out there, Snorkel's having a conference, a virtual conference too. So we'll drop a link to that in the chat. Uh, it's coming up soon, I think. And when, or am I speaking out of turn, Alex? Was that a secret? Did I just blow the secret? I'm, I'm not even, I don't even know. So I, 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 I don't think it's a secret. Uh, <laughs> oh, I, I, no. even, yeah. I didn't even know we were like giving out socks and stuff and sponsoring. So, um, let's assume it's not. And uh, uh, at least for this group, otherwise it's super, super secret exclusive announcement. Yeah, we'll be running. And thanks for bringing it up. We'll be running another version of our, our um, uh, future of data centric AI conference. That's it. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah. We've had some exciting speakers before last time, you know, a bunch of academic folks. Uh, we had the, uh, the incoming, um, I think uh, uh, CISO of the CIA gave, gave a talk. Um, uh, so, you know, academic, federal, industry, um, all open, um, largely kind of tilted towards academic uh, uh, type stuff. Um, and uh, all about this, this intersection this year of foundation models and data-centric development methods. So, uh, yeah, if anything that I said today piqued your interest, uh, please uh, consider showing up. And Demetrius, thank you so much for all the time today. It's a pleasure, man. Thank you for joining us. And I'll drop all those links into the chat. Yeah.